Okay, everybody, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Thank you. Yeah, we're all kind of zeroing in. Wow. 8.30 jumped on us this morning, didn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's good that we're here today. There's uh, really one purpose in our being here, and that is to honor our Father in all that we do. And uh, we're going to pray in just a second. But I do have some announcements, some ministry notes. I like that word better. Some ministry notes that uh, uh, we need to uh, speak about. One, the first one is something we're going to celebrate. Okay? So when we celebrate something, think tomorrow night when Georgia has won that game. Think about what you'll be doing. Did anybody see the uh, video of Trey dancing in the, uh, at the game last week? Never knew he was Pentecostal, but now I know. He's got it in him. Um, so I want us to celebrate something. It's not related to football. It's related to something far greater than football. Uh, we as a church, during the season of giving to Lottie Moon, exceeded our $13,000 goal. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. That is a great thing. Uh, and, and actually, I don't think all the Lottie Moon offerings have been counted but what are, 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 are applied to uh, the total. But where we are at the time of the printing of our newsletter, you might have noticed we had already exceeded that 13000 So that's a pretty cool thing. All right. So we've got some uh, something, a couple other things, some, some faces that you're going to be seeing maybe in different places. So, some of them you may not see as much. Others you'll see more often. Okay, first thing is that right up here at the piano, that's Nina Beth. Nina Beth is actually going to be uh, working with us in our student ministry as an intern, student ministry intern, yeah. And uh, she's going to be, the, the, the main thing she'll be focused on is working with the praise team, the youth praise team that serves on Wednesday nights over at the summit. So glad to have you. That's pretty exciting. Second thing, there's a young man, Nina Beth came up in the ministries of this church, and that's what's kind of cool about that. There's another guy that came up in the ministries of this church. His name is Ben Mullis. How many of you know Ben Mullis? Yeah. yeah. Ben Mullis is going to be with us from uh, starting on Wednesday and then through the end of this semester. This is his final semester in seminary. And um, he is, uh, one of his required classes is kind of a practicum uh, to serve uh, as a shadow or a ministry intern somewhere. And he came to me and he said, PK, is there any chance I could do that at, at, at the church? And I said, absolutely. So he's going to be with us every Wednesday. He'll be around the office. You'll see him uh, in services doing different things because the whole purpose of that is to expose him to a lot of the different parts of vocational ministry behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. And I'm pretty excited about that. I get to grade him at the end of the semester. I'm so excited about that. And uh, I've told him, Ben, listen, just relax. You're starting out with a C. And just, you know, you're good. So we want to welcome Ben. I don't think Ben's in here this morning. If he's here, normally he's at 11 o'clock. But when you see Ben, tell him, hey, that's uh, pretty cool that you're going to be hanging around. And then the third thing, some personnel stuff, is, um, as you know, our, our ministry assistant, uh, Miss Jennifer, uh, is actually getting ready to start her second semester of nursing school. We were able to work in and around her school schedule last semester, but... It uh, doesn't look like it's going to be a possibility. This one, you know, we've been running ads. And she starts school on Thursday of this week. And we weren't exactly sure what we we're going to do because we had only had two applicants for that job. And our personnel committee uh, didn't feel the Lord's hand in either one of those. And then God just brought somebody out of the blue, right? Uh, unexpected. And so um, <clears throat> Melissa Blankenship is going to be our interim, serving as our interim ministry assistant uh she'll, when, when you walk in the door after wednesday you'll see melissa sitting there saying good morning what i gotta do for you and uh of course right now she's coming she's being trained some with jennifer and the great news is that jennifer is not like moving to another state so she's a phone call away so is melissa in this room this morning i don't think she comes to this service either uh, you'll notice all these people are like later morning people so Melissa's going to be joining us, but only until March. She's already made a commitment to be a long-term sub for someone who's having a baby at the high school. And uh, she said, she just came up and she said, hey, I, I, I could help from now till now and give you some more time. And so we jumped on that. We, you know, God provides in really unique ways, so we're glad to have her. So those are three things. So when you see 
uh, Nina Beth, Ben, Melissa, tell them thank you, welcome, good to have you, and all that good kind of stuff. Normal, normal Sunday schedule, uh, ministry schedule, and Wednesday ministry schedule going on now. We're in uh, out of the holiday schedule. Uh, tonight, Awana, youth will be over at the summit. No. Is that right? Is Sunday night Awana? Yeah. Okay, I'm right. Uh, and then adults will be in here in the fellowship hall. Now, let me say a quick thing about this is all you grown-up people call adults. We've been doing... Uh, for about six weeks prior to when we took a break right around Thanksgiving, uh, a series called Culture Shock. It's a study in absolute truth. What does the Bible say about these big issues in our culture? And we've, we've looked at the issue of sexuality and all that's going on with that. We've looked at the issue of um, something else. And so, um, <clears throat> homosexuality. <laughs> And, and so uh, we're gonna, tonight we pick that back up and we begin the next little part of that. It's called um, Understanding Abortion Today. And if there's one thing that Christians really need to be clear about what God says about life and the importance of life, this is one of those issues. But not just what God says, but how do we stand up for that uh, in a compassionate way? How do we speak to our culture in the direction it's moving? Now, if you're sitting there going, gosh, I haven't even been to any of them, it doesn't matter. You can, you can step right in tonight. You can come in any, any, any Sunday night, um, um, and, and we'd love to have you. But that all starts at 530 this evening. Legacy Builders, a couple of things. Clyde, if I miss anything, where's Clyde? If I miss anything, I'm sure you'll let me know. Thursday, 10 o'clock, brunch right here in the Fellowship Hall. Is that right? Jeff Cleghorn is going to be a guest, and um, so I invite you to come be a part of that you're involved with Legacy Builders, and then there's also a Legacy Builders Retreat at St. Simon's Island, Epworth by the Sea, April 24th through 26th. The sign-up for that ends, it's already open, but it ends on January the 31st. $50 deposit is $299 per person, double <laughs> occupancy. Got it all done. Deacons will meet next Sunday at 4 o'clock p.m., and I think that's all the ministry notes that I have. Does anybody have an announcement they need to make? Anything at all? All right, so <clears throat> we're fixing to pray. And um, what, what are you expecting this morning? You don't have to yell it out, but I should always think about that for a minute. What are you, what are you expecting? And what are you hoping for as we gather together? Now, I know some of you are like to, to stay awake, to, you know, throughout the service. But in, in, in the deeper sense of worship, what are we hoping for? To be fed spiritually, okay? And that's the work of who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit feeds us through music, through the message of music, through Bible study. To be encouraged, to be strengthened, to maybe be challenged um, in a new way. I hope that you're here not just to be entertained, but to give yourself to the moment. To say, you know, God, speak into my heart. Give me the courage to respond to you in whatever way I need to respond today, whether publicly or privately. And, you know, maybe you're here today and you've been thinking about joining the fellowship of this church to be a part of what God's doing here. Maybe this is the day God wants you to make that public. Even better, maybe today's the day you take your first ever stand for Jesus Christ. Maybe you've already asked him into your heart, but you've never stood up and professed him. The Bible's pretty clear that it's, it's when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's part of Maybe this is that day when you stand up and you take your first ever stand with Christ. I hope you're open to what he wants to speak into you. Um, let's stand together and pray, and then we're going to sing. How's that? Father God, we are here in your presence, and we don't want just on the outside to look like we're worshiping. We just don't want to go through the motions of bowing our head and closing our eyes and praying and singing and whatever. Father, we want to be bowed before you in our hearts and our minds. Father, I pray by your Holy Spirit, the ministry of your Holy Spirit in us, your presence surrounding us, your angels standing guard over us. Father, in this moment, in this place that is right now your sanctuary because your people are gathered here in your name, Father, would you do the mighty work that only you can do? Would you speak into our hearts? 
Would you comfort us, encourage us, challenge us, convict us, whatever is needed? Father, I pray you would stand in the way of any scheme Satan uh, would try to distract us from your voice today. We love you. We love you. We love you. And it's in the strong name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone. Men are on the ground, no matter where we go. I don't need to worry, that's I know. Everything I need, you've got. There's honey in the rock.
forget the things that I taught you. I conquered death and I hold the key. Where I go, you will go to someday. There's much to do here before you are dismissed while I go and let's pray okay Jesus thank you for today thank you for all that you've blessed us with thank you for this new year and I pray that we would be devoted to telling the world about the good news about Jesus um, about what you did about what it means about how it gives all of life stability and meaning and purpose and um, I pray that we would just be in tune uh, with with your will as far as uh, the commission goes and that we would be vigilant, that would be, we would be observant, that we would be um, just very sensitive to the opportunities that, that we come across every single day uh, to be your instruments, to be salt and light. And I pray that you do a work in us for that. Uh, be with PK as he comes and guides us in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And it's good to be back together in here. Yes? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Blaise Pascal, you may have heard that name, maybe not. I would encourage you, um, if you are not familiar with this individual who has been dead for a really long time, um, to do a Google search on him when you get home. Don't do it right now. And, um, and read about his life. It's such an interesting life. Incredible intellect. And, but also things that he wrote about his faith. Blaise Pascal wrote one time, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Think about that for a minute. All of humanity's problems stem from a man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. He wrote that m many years ago. There's even less solitude and quietness today than there was when he was writing that. I want you to turn in your Bible to Matthew. We're going to look in Matthew, and we're going to read a couple of verses from Mark and from Luke. <clears throat> we are going to give you an opportunity to make a commitment at the end of this service. 
Um, not a big one, but it's a hard one. It's a very simple one, but challenging, okay? We're going to pick up the story, and we're looking at the life of Jesus. So we want to, what we're trying to do, we're, 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 we're looking at how Jesus lived his life and what does that maybe say to us. So we're going to pick it up in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. So the Bible says, now when Jesus heard this, just real quick so that we understand, this is referring back just a couple of verses where he received the news that John the baptizer had been beheaded. So, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist had a very unique relationship. And um, John the Baptist had been arrested and then he was beheaded and Jesus had received that news. So when the scripture says, now when Jesus heard this, that's what it's referring to. He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. Well, that, that's, that's a fairly normal human reaction many of us might think. I mean, when we, when we receive news that causes us to grieve, we, we just want to be by ourselves and think about it a little bit. When my daddy died, um, he died in the, in the bed in his house. Hospice was there, and, and when they had declared him, uh, dead and, uh, and that whole process and all the people coming in and out. But when there was time, I, I, I got into my truck, drove over to uh, Gascoigne Bluff on St. Simon's Island, which is one of my places, and um, just pulled up there and parked and probably sat there for about an hour and a half. Didn't talk to anybody, didn't listen to anything. I just, I was there. I, you can all relate to that. He withdrew. I want to talk about that word desolate, if I can, for just a minute. Hey, Ramos is the Greek word that that's translated from, and it can mean literally a desert, okay, just a, a dry, deserted place. It can mean uninhabited. It can mean lone, like single place. It's, it's the idea that Jesus withdrew um, to go somewhere where there was nothing else. Now, I want you to lock on to that. In, in, in his search for quietness or a quiet time, he went to a place where there was nothing else. And he went by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. He was going by boat. They, on foot, made their way around. And when he got ashore, he saw a great crowd. Okay, he was going for what? To be by himself. He gets to where he's going to be by himself, and who's there? People. Is there anything more frustrating than thinking you're about to have some downtime, some quiet time, some not having to answer any question time, and then something intrudes on that? Yeah? Anybody? Anybody ever had that, that happen before? If you're a parent, you've had that happen before. Okay? I'm telling you. It's a very frustrating thing. I say, so with Jesus, he's heard this, this, this uh, heartbreaking news to him, sad news, although he knew he, knew he would see John the Baptist again. It's the same, same thing we know when people we love who know Jesus die. But still, in his humanity, it hurt. He wanted to, to withdraw, so he withdrew to a desolate place where he thought there was nothing else. And when he got there, there was the very thing that's around him all the time in his earthly ministry, other people. They're there. Okay, and I want you to look at his response to the moment. He was seeking out some quiet time. He got to the place where he was going to have some quiet time. There were a bunch of people there, and he had compassion on them. And he healed the sick. Okay, see, this is what separates Jesus from most of us. When we've got our plan to just be quiet, a cup of coffee, just, just for a few minutes, and somebody intrudes, more times than not, our response is probably more along the lines of what? Would you just leave me alone? Five minutes, five minutes. That's all I ask. My wife, bless her heart, when we had three boys running around the house, um, she, would, uh, she would tell me these stories because 
you know, I wasn't there a lot of times when they were going on during the day. And, um, but there would be times where she just needed a bit of quietness. And so early on, she figured out the bathroom was not the place to have quietness. Because, uh, I mean, a minute in, somebody's going to be knocking on the door. Mama, what are you doing? Mama, can I come in? Mama, are you taking a bath? Mama, can I come in? Can I get in the tub with you, Mom? And so she found a closet that had enough space in it for her to squeeze in. She could shut the door. Okay? And she would go in there and shut the door. And that worked for two days, maybe three. And my boys, being as intelligent as they are, they looked everywhere else and figured she's got to be behind that closed door right there. Mama, are you in the closet? Mama, why are you in the closet? And, and, you know, I'd come home, and, and that's why one of my greatest ministries to my wife early in our marriage was coming home and taking all three boys and just taking them away from the house, whether it was out in the yard to play ball, whether it was to go on a bike ride around the block, whether it was go over to the basketball court at the church, and she, just to get them out of the house so she could have that quiet time. It's tough. But Jesus had compassion on them. And so what did he start doing? He started doing what he does. He, he began to heal their sick. He started ministering to them. And now... When it was evening, the disciples came to him, and they said, this is a desolate place, okay? This is a place where there is nothing else. All we got here is us and all these people. There's not a McDonald's. There's not a Wendy's. There's not a Popeye's. There's nothing here. The day's over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said, no, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, well, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Now, this is a guy, Jesus, who had been looking to have some quiet time. And when he got to the place where he was going to have some quiet time, he ran into thousands of people. And now when his disciples come up and say, okay, let's call it a day, he says, no, day's not done yet. Bring me that little bit of food we have. Everybody sit down. This is going to be a powerful blessing I'm fixing to ask. So he looked up to heaven. He said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces that were left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Well, now, now the day's done. There's been a lot of ministry, <clears throat> stuff going on, a lot of love being shown. A meal has been provided by the, for these thousands of people that are out here in the middle of nowhere where there is nothing and so after, at the close of the day, he, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And then look at verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went right back to what his whole purpose had been. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Being alone in the presence of his father was a priority in the life of Jesus. Even when he had to fight for that priority, just like he does in this story right here, where he starts out with that, ministry presents itself, you deal with what's in front of you, but you never lose sight of, I need to be in the presence of my father. My soul needs that. If you keep reading, and we're not going to, <clears throat> it's just after this, that uh, in the fourth watch of the night, I think it is, uh, he begins to make his way out to the disciples, and they're on the boat, and it's kind of stormy. And so he goes from seeking a desolate place to be alone to thousands of people, a lot of ministry, sending everybody away, up on the mountain praying by himself. The disciples are in a boat. There's a storm. He's up here praying, and then it comes down. This is a great moment in Peter's life when Peter jumps out of the boat and learns a lesson about faith, and, 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 then, and then Christ ministers his peace to the whole situation. I, I, I want to challenge you a little bit about your quiet times with Jesus today. This is, this is like spiritual formation 101, okay? This is probably the most important thing in your life ever. Not the extent of your knowledge of Scripture, although that is so, so critically important. Not how many Sundays in a row you've come to church. Not how much money you give to the church. The most important thing in your life 
One is that you're in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be in relationship with your Heavenly Father, with your Creator, than through His Son, Jesus Christ. And then, and then being in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the most important thing to your spiritual health is the practice of quiet time, of being in the presence of God with no agenda, with, 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 with no... Um, with no notion other than to just be with your Father, just to be in His presence. And when we make that a priority of our life, it doesn't cause us to miss ministry opportunities. It opens the door for more impactful ministry opportunities. You see, the human reaction to life is, I got to do more, I got to do more, I got to do more. Christ calls us to something completely contrary. No, no, you need to be. You need to be with me, be with me, be with me. And in being with me, your life suddenly takes on more significance and, and your life has more impact in your community, in your circle of relationships. Let me show you just so that you see this is not a one-time thing. You can turn over there or you can listen to me either way, but I want you to turn to the first chapter of Mark, okay? Everybody turn there that, that, that will. Mark chapter 1. You know, Mark, <clears throat> Mark's gospel is, is, the, uh, is the shortest of all the gospels. He, he jumps right to it. I mean, he jumps right to it, chapter 1, into the life of Jesus. Now, we're going to read two verses that are not one. Or we're going to read one, then one a couple of verses later, and then one a couple of or verses later. But I want you to get the context here. Mark 1, 28. Okay, we're going to start in verse 28. There. We're talking about Jesus here. And, and at once, meaning related to the ministry he's been involved in prior to verse 28, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So his fame, the knowledge of who he is and what was being done in his ministry was spreading. Skip down to verse 33. <clears throat> And the whole city was gathered together at the door. I mean, people were pressing in to be a part of this ministry, to, 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 to experience, experience this thing that they had never seen before. Skip down now to verse 35. In the middle of all that, his fame spreading, people pressing at the door, people pressing in, wanting to talk with, be touched by, to listen to Jesus. Verse 35 tells us, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to, there it is again, a desolate place. And there he prayed. This was the habit that Jesus had. This was a habit of going somewhere where there was nothing else, no distractions, seeking out a desolate place to spend time with his father. So much so in verse 36, so Simon and those who were with him, they did like my boys. They searched for him. Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where are you? And finally they found him and they said, look, everyone's looking for you. Man, that is pressure right there. Has anybody ever had a, had a job? Maybe it's your, your ministry as a parent, but maybe it's also your vocation. Have you ever had those times in your job where it feels like everybody wants you? <laughs> I heard one quick yeah from the front. Yeah, I'll see you at the altar in a little bit. Okay, so, I mean, you've been there. It seems like there's one question after another. Somebody needs to tell you something. Something's go wrong. They need to ask you a question. They're upset about something. You offended them, whatever, and it's just constant, just going on. Everyone's looking for you, but in the middle of all that, his fame and people at the door and all this, what did he do early while it was dark? He went to some place where there was nothing else to pray, to be with his father. In Luke chapter 4, verse 42, in Luke's gospel, just kind of showing you how this is spread all through the gospels, we're told in Luke 4, 42, speaking of Jesus, and when it was day, he departed, and he went into a desolate place. He got by himself. He intentionally got by himself. In Luke 5, Starting at verse 15, kind of like Mark's 
account. But now even more, Luke 5, 15, but now even more the report about him went abroad. Now even more people were hearing about it. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Okay, I want, I want you to kind of get this, if you haven't already. There needs to be, in all of our lives, this idea of withdrawing to places where there is nothing else. Doesn't have to be for a long period of time, but it needs to be something we do on a regular basis, and we do it intentionally. As a matter of fact, we're not going to read it, but if you, uh, we probably will next week in part two of this, but in Mark chapter 6, Jesus invites his disciples to come away to a desolate place because he knew they needed as much as he, if not more. So let me make some application. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to commit to something. Very simple. It won't cost you a dime. <clears throat> Bless you. You're welcome. Julie, was that you? I'll take that as a yes. I want you to listen to this statement I'm fixing to make. <clears throat> it's never true that you don't have time for quiet time with Jesus. It is truer to say it's not a priority of mine to make time for quiet time with Jesus. And that's the truth. Anytime somebody says to me, I just don't have time for a quiet time, I know they're lying to themselves. And I know their priorities are messed up. We, look at me. You make time for the things that you know are important. You will even sacrifice in making the time to do the things that you know are important. Quiet time must be in your life, like in the life of Jesus, a priority. Something that you will fight for. Something that you will pursue and you will not be deterred, even if for a moment, like Jesus in Matthew, where he went to have some quiet time and thousands of people showed up. He dealt with that. He ministered. He showed great compassion. He fed them. He dismissed them. And then he went right back to his priority. I need to be still in the presence of God. The psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. Not be active. And know that I'm God, be still, be quiet, be in a desolate place where there is nothing else, and just center your heart, mind, and soul on me. So, you know, I look at Scripture, the ones that I've read to you today, and, 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 and many others that, that I'm not, but they're all focused in the same way. And I have to ask myself, and you need to ask yourself, if Jesus, the Son of God, needed quiet moments with his father on a regular basis, how much more do probably each one of us need those kind of quiet moments? How, how much more do we need to set a priority on being with our father for no other purpose than just to be with him, to be wrapped in his presence, to let his glory and his holiness just drench us to the very fiber of our soul. For 2,000 years, the teachings of Christ, the pattern of Christ's life, the example he set before us, for 2,000 years we've been looking at it, and one of the things that we see consistently is that he calls us, me and you, into these patterns, these rhythms of retreating and returning. Retreating from the world for, for quietness and, and to be centered and to be fed and to be nourished in the presence of God so that we might return to the world to engage and to give our life away in service for the kingdom. Retreating, returning. 
the Mount of Transfiguration. Man, what a prayer meeting they had up there. That was incredible, right? The presence of the holiness of God. And as soon as they got down to the bottom, what did they run into? Ministry. Opportunity to ministry. Retreating and returning. And we see this in the life of Christ. And we begin to understand that if we're going to be healthy Christians... And, 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 and spiritually impactful Christians, and then that means our, our life is, is neither wholly solitary nor is it wholly communal. It's not all about being in church, and it's not all about being alone. It's the balance of those. It's the priority of both of those, of being quiet in the presence of God. Because we too, all of us in here, we need, and I, I mean more than once a month or a couple, three times a year, we need to withdraw like Jesus, to a desolate place, to a place where there is nothing else, nothing to distract us, nothing to steal our attention, nothing to draw us away from that moment, whether it's five minutes or 50 minutes, whether it's a day, whether it's a weekend-long retreat, whether it's just, just whatever it is, just those times when we withdraw into the presence of God to commune with Him, to be drenched by His presence. And then we come out of that ready to get back into the into the realities of living and, and loving people. We all need these momentary sacred spaces, if I can put it that way. These sacred spaces where we just... If you're going out, whatever that highway is, What's the bypass? What's the highway number? Is it 20? Huh? If you're going out 87, it's like you're going to Macon. Yeah? Everybody with me? But then you go straight through the four-way stop. And you're going, now you're on the two-lane roads. Everybody with me? And you're driving along. Okay? And a lot of times, I will turn right, right there at the chalk plant, whatever the name of that road is. Yeah, that's, I knew it was a, a Greek word, Skoda Road. Skoda. And I'll hit the interstate. But there are times when I'll intentionally go straight right there. And if you keep going straight, period, uh, uh, there will come up on your left a, a little turnoff to a little swamp area where there's a boat landing. Who, who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, gum swamp. There's hardly ever any... There's hardly ever... Any, Anybody there? I think he lives there. But other than that, <laughs> there's hardly ever anybody there. And there'll be these times when I'm driving, and it's like, I just, I need a sacred space. I need, I need, I need to withdraw. And I'll go, and I'll turn into Gum Swamp, and 99% of the time, there's not a single vehicle there anywhere. And I'll park, and I'll walk on down to the, to the river right there, and I'll just sit, maybe five minutes. If I, you don't time it. But that becomes a sacred space. That becomes a place of worship. Where I, I don't sit there and pour my heart out to God. I just sit there and let God pour his presence over me. God already knows what's in my heart. I need to know what's in God's heart. I need to know his peace. His presence, his encouragement. I, I need to be reminded that all the fears that maybe I'm dealing with in my life, he's got that. All the questions, he's got that. It's amazing what, just five minutes, ten, in the quietness of maybe the most beautiful sanctuary ever, and that is God's nature. I get up and walk out of there a different person. I don't know how to explain it. Outside of telling you, it's the work of God. I just get my, 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 my step is lighter, my spirit is lighter, the smile is brighter. I don't look any better, but the smile is brighter. And there's an energy that comes in. It's like a spiritual power nap when you, when you get into the presence of God in a solitary, desolate place with no agenda other than to be wrapped in the arms of your Father in heaven. Let me say a couple of things to you real quick, and then what I want to invite you to do. What's the purpose of these quiet times, okay? It's, 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 a, 
It's really a simple thing. It's to, it's to center your mind, heart, and soul on Christ. It's not to empty your mind. See, a lot of people say, Man, I, just, I, w- I just wish I could go somewhere by myself and just empty my mind. No, you don't want to empty your mind. You want to fill your mind up with the presence and the holiness of God. You want to be awed by his love for you, awed by his, his, his intimate knowledge of your life. You want to be awed by the fact that you are his son or his daughter. You want, to be, you want, to, you want these times where you're just absolutely inundated with the incredible, extravagant love of God for you. It's, it's these, these quiet times that I'm looking at today, it's, it's about also developing this spiritual discipline of stillness. Just being still in the presence of God. Some of us go into what we think of as a quiet time and we cannot keep our mouth shut. It's like we step in there and we start right into our list and we're on that list till it's time to go do something else. And I think there are times when God just, his spirit's trying to say to you, be quiet. Everything you're telling me, I already know it. I already know it. I need you to know me. And in knowing me, you'll know. You'll have that peace that passes all understanding. So, it's about the spirit, and I do believe it's the spiritual discipline of stillness. We see Christ practicing this, finding desolate places where there is nothing else. It's, a, it's also about dampening the noise of the urgent. Man, some of us live like from one urgent thing to the next, and we miss the important because the voice of the urgent is so loud and then after the fact, we're like, that wasn't such a big deal. That didn't have to be done just right now. And, and it's a recharge. It, it's, like I said, it's like a power nap for your soul, power nap for your spirit. I looked up, what, what's, the, what's the length of time for a good power nap? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Does anybody in here ever take a power nap? Anybody ever do that? I kind of always thought it was like four to five hours. You know, was a, that was a good power nap. My wife still thinks that. She practices that discipline almost every day. Not four or five hours. I mean, she loves a nap. But how many of you ever taken a nap and, and it was too long and you wake up just so groggy and it's like you drag the rest of the day? But a power nap is it's, it's a nap where you get, get in sleep. You don't get into that deep sleep. And, and they say on average a, a 20 minute, 15 to 20 minutes is a good power nap. This kind of quiet time that we're seeing in Christ, and then I'm going to invite you to, to if you're not already, and even if you are, I'm going to ask you to, to do this with us, is it, just these moments where we just come into a sacred moment to just be in the presence of God. Now, let me make one clarification real quick. And over the next three or four weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the basic disciplines to grow your faith. Quiet times is what we're starting with. Next Sunday will be a quiet time. Then the next two weeks, we're going to look at personal Bible study. Now, I want you to understand something. Personal Bible study and quiet time are similar, but they're not the same. Okay? You need to have these quiet moments in these desolate places, okay, that are separate from your Bible study time. Bible study time is about a pursuit of knowledge of God and truth from God. Quiet time is about just being in the presence of God and being washed by His presence. Sometimes the two can coexist, absolutely. But how many of you, I don't know to ask, how many of you in here who kind of think of quiet time in your personal Bible study time where you're really involved in a systematic Bible study, and we're going to talk about that, okay? You know that you're going to need 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on what the Bible study is you're doing. And you look, and you don't have that long. And so what do you do? What do you do? You skip it. Okay? You're like, golly, 
I don't hardly get down in that Bible study for 40 minutes, 30, 30 40 minutes. I, didn't, I just you know, I had to be able to do it today. See, that's why you got to be careful about combining your quiet time and your Bible study time. Because a quiet time, in the pure sense of the word, it, it can be a, it can be a, it can be a five minutes, it can be eight minutes, it can be twelve, just a moment where you intentionally find that desolate place, and you just break down the presence of God. Okay, so here we go. Chuck Swindoll, who is a pretty good preacher, a really good author as well. I want you to listen to his words. In place of our exhaustion and spiritual fatigue, God will give us rest. All he asks is that we come to him, that we spend a moment thinking about him, meditating on him, talking to him, listening in silence, occupying ourselves with him totally and thoroughly lost in the hiding place of his presence. That's what Jesus was doing in those desolate places. Okay, so here's my challenge. In a minute, we're going to sing a song, okay? And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask those of you who would to, to make this commitment, okay? Here it is. I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to explain a little bit. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment between now and next Sunday, just a week-long commitment, to spend seven minutes a day. That's nothing. Right. Keep thinking that. I'll, I'll get back with you next Sunday. Seven minutes a day in a desolate place with no other agenda than to be in the presence of God. Seven minutes. Why seven? I don't know, because it's a perfect number in Scripture. So, it seems like a good number to start with. Doesn't seem as long as 10. You know, if I said spend 10 minutes, y'all would be like, I ain't got 10 minutes. Seven minutes. I got seven minutes. Here's the commitment. Between starting today, I want you to find a desolate place today. Starting today through Saturday, and then we'll be together Sunday. Every day, seven minutes. Now, if you're already having a regular quiet time, if you're having a quiet time Bible study, that's, that's good. I want you to add this, at least for the next week. Just seven minutes, okay? Every day, number two, desolate place. Now, I want you to listen closely here, and you're not going to like this, okay? No phone in that place with you. As a matter of fact, when you get ready to go to your desolate place for your seven minutes, if you make this commitment, this is the best thing you can do. Take that smartphone you've got, walk to the back door, open it, throw it, and then come back in. Yeah, but, you know, my iWatch is going to let me know if it's ringing. Second best thing you do, take your iWatch off, walk to that back door, throw it. Come back in. You can go back and get them later. If it's raining outside, then just throw them down the hallway. No phone, no watch. Okay? No TV, no music. I, I would even suggest no light. I'm so easily distracted. Anybody else in here have that problem? So easily distracted. No lie. I've got these two little gooseneck uh, book lights. You know what I'm talking about. Okay? Take one of those with you because you're throwing your phone out the door. You're throwing your iPad out the door. And you're sitting there looking at me and go, that's what I use for my scripture. I bet you've got, a, you've got a hard copy Bible somewhere in your house. Get that hard copy Bible. A desolate place. None of those. If you need to coordinate this, if you're in a house with children, you might want to need to coordinate it with your spouse and say, look, I, I'm, I'm going to spend seven minutes. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to be, but you're not going to see me. I just need you to keep the children off of me for seven minutes. A place where no one is likely to stumble into your quietness. And this is what I want you to do in those seven minutes. Just so simple today, okay? I want you to just be quiet. Enter that place. I mean, literally, a closet is a great place to do this. Put your chair in there or a cushion on the floor. Shut the door. 
And the very first thing is to say, God, I so want you. I just want to be with you. Take a Bible in there with you. You can borrow one of my gooseneck book lights if you need it. Read one chapter of Scripture. I would suggest either from the Gospel of John or from the Psalms. Just one chapter. Read it out loud, quietly, but read it out loud. Slowly. Let those words sink in. And when a when the Holy Spirit catches your heart at a verse, reread that verse. Maybe even reread it again. And when you've read that chapter, close your Bible and spend the rest of those seven minutes just centering your heart, soul, and mind on the glory of Christ. Just speak His name. Let your thoughts reach up to the throne of heaven. Recognize your heart's desperate need for the love of God, the grace of God. And His Spirit's probably going to start to work in there. And you're going to think of something all of a sudden and it's going to embarrass you. And it's, it's the Holy Spirit saying, I need you to confess this to me. So I can forgive you and wash you. This is stealing your joy. He might put something into your heart that he, he wants to direct you to. I don't, I don't know. See, you don't go in with an agenda in these quiet times. You just come in there and you're saying, God, I just, in the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit that surrounds me and lives in me in this moment, feed me. Seven minutes. Well, how do I know when seven minutes is up? Well, be, you know, y'all are pretty smart people. Take a stopwatch in there with you. If you have a watch that has an alarm on it, set that alarm. For some of you, that first day of seven minutes is going to feel like 30. You're going to go through everything I've just said, and, and you're still going to have six and a half minutes left. You're going to go, oh, no, I do. And then, and then if, if you will do this... I'm guaranteeing by the latter half of the week, however it is you know when seven minutes is up, you're going to start thinking, that's not enough. <laughs> I don't want to get up. I don't want to leave. But this is what we see in the life of Christ, retreat to return. Being fed in the presence of of God in a desolate place with nothing else distracting us so that we might get into the business and ministry in our world. Seven minutes in a desolate place with nothing but Scripture, the Holy Spirit, and the presence of God. Seven minutes. So our praise team is going to come up. Praise team, come on up. That's your cue. Now, in just a moment, they're going to be singing a song, I Surrender All, which is a great song. And so I'm not even asking you to surrender all. I'm asking you to surrender seven minutes, seven minutes every day. You're going to have to fight for this. It seems so simple right now. I know that. You're going to have to fight for this. Even if you make this commitment today, I'm promising you tomorrow something is going to get in the way of it. You're going to go home, and there's going to be a 1,000 people wanting you to feed them supper. You better say a good blessing, get it done, send them on, and then get on to your desolate place. But if it's a priority, it's worth fighting for. You might have to get up early while it's still dark to find that desolate place in that seven minutes of uninterrupted time. I don't know. Man, it's so critical to your spiritual vitality. It's not mad, it's not magic. There's nothing magic in the seven. I told you there's nothing. You know, that's just a good number. So in just a second, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand up and sing. If you're willing 
in the presence of, of other believers to, to say, I'll give it a shot. At least for a week. That's all I'm asking. Seven minutes in a desolate place every day. I'm going to ask you to come to kneel somewhere up here. Make that commitment, not to me, but to God. God, I'm, I'm going to pursue you in this way. Make it a priority in my heart. And then you can go back to your seat. Or you may, maybe you want to come with somebody and pray for each other. But you come as soon as we start singing. Father God, we love you today. We thank you for what we see in the life of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this, this pattern we see in him of being so, so busy in ministry. And yet, the priority of going to a place where there is nothing else to just be with you. Because you really are all that we need. Father, we want our lives to be like the life of Jesus. That's our calling. More and more being transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so, Father, I, I just pray you speak to the hearts uh, of all who are here. And Father, if there is one or two or ten or a hundred who would, who would at least make this commitment seven minutes a day in a desolate place, Father, give us the courage to make that public just by now bowing in your presence and committing that to you. This I pray in the strong name of Jesus and trusting in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in this room. Amen. Let's stand as soon as they start, even right now. If you're willing to make that seven-minute commitment, just come on down and start giving it to God. Jesus.
Jesus, I surrender all. I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. And I line again and all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all okay seven minutes I'm hoping maybe next week some of you might share what that experience was like. If you miss the day, don't condemn yourself. Jump back on it. Fight for it. Fight for it. This, this commitment you just made to do this for a week may be, you may look back on this Sunday, 10 years from now and say, that was the Sunday when my life began to change and I started growing in the Lord in a forceful way because I began to let God establish in me this whole idea of sacred moments in his presence. Okay, so how many of you know Paisley? Yeah. Paisley comes today, and um, Paisley comes today because she's done something really special. What did you do? Accepted Jesus in my heart. And so now you're ready to do what? Be baptized. She's ready to be baptized. Now, I want to tell you something. This is not something that just started, okay? And uh, Jeff and Tracy have been doing such a good job of teaching and, and training and listening. And uh, she's at a place now. Uh, we were sitting here talking. I had talked to her the other day. It's just so incredible to hear a seven-year-old talk about Jesus. He died and, uh, for our sins. And is he still dead? No, 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 he's not dead. He came back to life. And, he died for us. Why? Because he loves us so much. And so she comes today just to give public um, testimony of what's actually already taking place in her heart. And here real soon, there's going to be a baptism. And she'll be stepping into the baptistry. She will be one of those who will almost disappear as soon as she steps into it and sits down. And we'll be sharing that. So if you rejoice in that with Paige of the Day, let me know by doing something to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask um, Paisley, would you go back and join your family? You can go back down there right now. Go ahead. You're good. And then would y'all mind going and, and kind of standing at the door? Because I know a lot of people like to give pay. Well, if she even makes it that far. Uh, y'all give Paisley a hug. They'll be back there at the door on your way out. Let's pray. And uh, then we're going to small groups. Father God, we bow with our hearts. We bow our mind. We bow our will to your holiness, to your majesty, to your authority. Father, teach us to make a priority of pursuing moments sacred moments with you. It's in the strong name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.